All right, so we begin with linear regression, right? Uh, linear regression, like I said, is an old friend of many of you, uh, most of you, I believe. And uh, you say, okay, what's, what's new about linear regression? Maybe nothing new, right? So we'll try to, maybe we can finish this topic very easily. Now, linear regression model, let's put in the, in the terms of what I just introduced, is a discriminative model, okay? It's not a generated model, because I give you x, we want to use it to model y, so it's discriminative, right? Now it's a model with fx equal to this, uh, the ey given x, the cf, as you can think about linear regression as the cf is your target function. You can think about that way. It's one kind of way of viewing it because the cf is the one, is the function that minimizes L2 in the underlying population. And linear regression is a sort of L2 minimizing uh, model, right? So we minimize, so the model is h, the big H equal to uh, a lot of small h, but what is a small h? What is our hypothesis? X prime beta. So the model is essentially the hy each hypothesis is a linear uh, hypothesis, right? X prime beta, and our model is a, is a set of all these hypotheses. Now, this x and the beta can both me be multidimensional, so I'm going to assume that x is, it contains a constant, right? There's a one, you know, from x1 to xp, so it's a p plus one dimensional variable and the beta is, is similarly a p plus one dimensional variable. So our goal is to find a g that belongs to this large set h, the best hypothesis that best, best approximates the underlying CF. You can think about that way, okay? All right, now what is the error measure? The error measure is L2 loss function, right? The expected value of L2. So E out, out of sample error, is the expected y minus hx squared. And remember, each hx, each hx is, a, is a linear hypothesis, x prime beta. And the in, the in sample version is the average of the unobserved data. So uh, linear regression, one of the uh, benefit or one of the advantages of a linear regression, or linear model, right? the model is linear. The linear model is that it's relatively simple model. And by simple, using the terminology we have concept we have learned, it means that they have a relatively small VC dimension. So the model is not too complex. The VC dimension of a linear model is P plus one. Remember the example I give in my foundation lecture that if I give you three data points, okay, suppose each, suppose our Y is a binary minus one plus one, then how many different possibilities? How many dichotomy do I have? Well, suppose I have plus one, plus one, minus one. That's one dichotomy. Can I use a linear model to separate them? Yes, I can do this, right? Now, if this is minus one, can I separate them? Yes. So a linear model can separate all possibilities. Can, se can basically separate, uh, can, can basically help us distinguish all kinds of dichotomies if we have three points. But and this is two dimensional, okay? So we have x2, x1, two dimension. Now, what if, what if we have four points? Remember this example. In four points, we cannot do it. If I have plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, is there any way for me to use a linear line to separate them? No longer, right? So a linear model cannot handle four points, but can handle three points. In that case, we see the VC dimension is three, right? Now, this is a two dimensional case x is two-dimensional. So if x is two-dimensional, vc dimension is three for linear model, right? So here, x is what? It's p-dimensional, right? Plus a constant. We have essentially p-dimensional x, so vc dimension is p plus one. Now p plus one is a relatively small vc dimension, right? This is, it's a relatively simple model. Therefore, if our n is large, we have many, many data points. If n is larger, larger than p, then the linear model typically generalizes very well from E into E out, meaning the bound is relatively tight. And that's why we start with this simple model, right? Okay, so what is the optimal beta? Well, if we uh, observe the entire population, we can calculate the beta star in the underlying population. So beta star, which is the best beta that minimizes the loss function or the error function in the underlying population is simply minimizing right, expectation of 
y minus x prime beta square. Okay. Very simple. Uh, and we're basically choosing the beta to minimize this, right? So r to me. Now, what is that? Well, you can take a derivative and you can write it out. It's all very easy. So you can basically, basically the uh, x prime inverse, right? X y. Right? So that's the that's the result. Okay. So this is beta star in the underlying population, the expected, right? the best optimal beta star. So this is called the population regression coefficient. It's not the uh, it's not the beta you beta have to calculate in observed data. It is the underlying best beta. So it's called a population regression coefficient. And you can think about the x prime beta star as essentially the best linear predictor of, uh, the, of y given x in the underlying population. Right? Okay. Now it turns out that uh, this is also equal to, so exactly this formulation is also equal to arg mean beta, the expectation of EY given x minus x prime beta squared. Okay, it's also equal to this. So replace the y with the CF function, EY given x. Remember this is called a CF, conditional expectation function, right? So replace the y with the CF, it's the same thing, okay? Right, obviously, as you can see. Um, but what does this tell us? It tells us that uh, you can think about x prime beta also, right? you can think about this also as the best linear approximation to the CF. So, right, so we just said that this x prime beta star is the best predictor of y given x, the best linear predictor, I'm sorry, the best linear predictor of y given x in the underlying population. And here the best, by best we mean minimum L2, right? Now, you can also think about it as the best linear approximation of the CF, because the CF is most often, you know, in, in almost every, you know, most circumstances, the CF is never linear, right? It's not linear, it's, it's a, it's a nonlinear function, but by using a linear model and, the, and the choosing the best beta star, we're finding out the best linear approximation of the CF function in the underlying population. Right? So that's another interpretation of beta star. One consequence of, uh, of minimizing and choosing this optimal beta star is that once we find out our beta star, we can say we can define E star as the residual of our model, right? So E star will be y minus x prime beta star. Okay, so that's the residual, and you can prove very easily that the expectation of x e star is going to be zero. So as long as beta star is the minimizing uh, min minimizer of the uh, uh, L two loss function, given the you know given the form we just see, we can always prove that x e star equal to zero. Now what does that mean? It means that x and e star are going to be what uncorrelated. Okay, They're uncorrelated. So as long as your beta star is the, is the optimal beta, then E star is going to be uncorrelated with X. Does everybody see that? Does this imply uncorrelation? Does this imply that they're independent, not correlated? So what is, what is what should, how should we write correlation? Correlation actually requires that X minus EX, right? And what? The covariance, right? E minus E, e this thing to be zero, right? Okay. So this, if this is, if only, we, if we only know this equal to zero, we may not really be uncorrelated, correct? But so here's the thing. Remember, our x includes a constant. Okay. So let's go back. Our x is not just x variable, but we also include the constant in here. So what is x e star? x e star is really one x one all the way to x p times e star, right? E star e star e star equal to zero. So every one of them equal to zero, which means the first 
the first element is just E star. So if this is equal to zero, that implies that implies E E star must be zero, okay? So this E star must be expected to zero. Now if this E star is expected to zero, then of course this implies they are uncorrelated. Okay? Right, so that's the that's the logic here. Right. Now this E star may not be zero if we do not have a constant term in X. So that's why we put a X a constant term in X, right? Take it back. Alright, so I, I hope that's all old stuff to you guys. Now If we, if we, if I separate the constant term out of the x, right, so if I write it this way, y is equal to uh, beta zero plus uh, x tilde, okay, prime beta tilde plus e, okay. If I write it this way, previously I wrote it as uh, you know x prime beta. So basically, I let x equal to one x tilde. So x tilde is everything, right? So this x tilde thing is really x1 all the way to xp. Okay. Okay, write it this way, and beta tilde beta is, is equal to beta zero and a beta tilde. If I write it this way, then the optimal beta tilde star, the optimal value for this, uh, we can calculate, you can prove is basically the variance of x tilde inverse covariance x tilde y. You can prove that. That's just a, just a consequence of writing in a different way, okay, from before. Now, what is beta zero? Uh, it's very easy. It's basically y minus uh, this, you know, x tilde prime beta tilde star. Right? So we have a solution uh, for both. Actually, I should do an expectation here. Uh, Now, uh, what does this mean? Uh, why do we introduce a just slightly different way of writing it? Well, it turns out that uh, if this is one dimension, the expression is even easier. Suppose we only have, suppose we only have beta, beta x, okay? Just this, one dimension. Right? So x tilde is just one dimensional, right? Now, beta star here, the best beta for this one is, again using the formula just now, is the covariance of xy divided by the variance of x. And I hope everybody has seen this formula. Is it? I think for people who start, you know, start with the linear regression in one dimensional, the, the most simple case, that's probably the first formula you learn about beta, right? The optimal beta. Because covariance, obviously, covariance x y is simply equal to covariance x beta zero plus beta one x plus e, right? Which is you know gets you beta covariance of x x, which is beta variance of x, and then we get this formula. So anyway, so this is this. I hope this this is familiar to everybody. Now, what may be unfamiliar to you is that. Once I have more than one dimension, once I have beta one x one plus beta two x two plus e, let's go to two dimension. What the previous formula, what this formula implies, is that the optimal beta one is this. Okay, instead of x, I'm going to re replace it with u one and u one. And what is this U1 thing? This U1 is the residual of running the following regression. Okay, I'm going to run the regression of X1 on the left-hand side, and I'm going to run the regression on X2. I'm going to say, okay, X1 is equal to alpha zero plus alpha one X2 plus sigma. So I'm going to run this regression. Sorry, U, okay. And then whatever is left is my u1. So u1 is the residual of running the regression of x1 on x2. And then what is left? I put it here, 
and this formula will give me the optimal beta of one star. Okay. Now, this formula may be unfamiliar to uh, some or maybe lots of you, right? Okay. But this is a very useful formula as well, as, and it also helps us understanding a lot of, uh, you know, the. So I will explain what help, what it helps us uh, understanding. But this is a direct consequence of this formula, okay? So this is a matrix, right? So this, this is a multidimensional uh, uh, matrix algebra that, that shows you this formula. But if you write, but if you deduce for each beta, then we have this formula, okay? And this U is the residual of running the regression of X on the other vectors, on the other variables. How do we understand this? Well, it's actually pretty easy intuitively. Intuitively, it says that this beta is the optimal beta if we get rid of the influence of x2 on x1. OK, right? So by running the regression of x1 on x2 and then taking the residual, I'm taking x2 away from x1. You can understand that one. Because why? Because x1 and x2 might be correlated, right? So, but the beta 1 is the influence of x1 on y. And x1 and x2 may be correlated. So the first step, what I'm doing here, is I'm taking the influence of x2 away from x1. So whatever is left is truly x1, not, not explained by x2. And then I correlate that with y, and that gives us the optimal beta y star. Right? So that's an intuitive way of understanding that. On a graph term, if you plot it, then you can think about this beta star as the plot of the slope of the regression curve using u here and y here. Now, if we only have this model, beta 0 plus beta x plus e, if we only have this one dimensional model, then what is this beta? It is x and a y, right? And we have a bunch of points. And the optimal linear fit is here. Then this beta is the slope, right? The slope of this line. Now. If we have more than one x in multidimensional case, each beta is still the slope of this fit. But we're replacing x not with x1, but with u1, which is the residual right, of running x1 on the other variables. Okay. All right, so we'll come back to, to this uh, formula uh, in, in, a, in a, this one minute, all right? But before uh, talking about that, uh, what so far we have been discussing is beta star, right? Is the optimal beta in the underlying population. Uh, but we do not see the underlying population, so we have to do an in-sample version, which is how to write out the optimal beta in terms of the data we actually observe. You can think about beta star as the auto sample, right? You can think about the, uh, the beta hat, which we're going to write out as the in-sample expression. So if we have n data points, our data set is D that consists of x1, y1, all the way to xn, yn. In that case, um, what is our optimal beta, right? So what is the formula for, le for linear regression uh, optimal beta fit? Before talking about the formula, uh, let's try to use some notation. Now, each x1, here x1 can be multidimensional. So x1 is really a constant, right? And I can say x11 all the way to x1p, where it's p-dimensional like this. So x2, x3, right? Each data point is a p plus one dimensional vector. I can put all of them together, right? Into a single big matrix, okay? So this, the, big, the big matrix will be one x11 all the way to x1p. That's the first x, uh, x1, that's the first data point. The second data point is 1, x2, 1, all the way to x2, p, right? So this is basically x1 here. This is basically x2 here, right, according to that point. Now, if we are being rigorous, I should prime prime because each is a column vector, I put it into row vector, and shove, you know, I shovel them into this whole matrix. So all the way to xn1 to xnp. And this large matrix, we call it the big X. I think all of you are familiar with this, right? so I'm wasting my time. Uh, so once we write it this way, then the in-sample version, in-sample expression of the beta star 
will just be beta hat, right? Okay. So beta hat is remember beta star is the expectation of x x prime inverse the expectation of x y. Now, if we write it as the yin sample version, then the expectation becomes the average, right? I think you're all familiar with that right now. It becomes the average. So one over n summation of i to the n, right? Okay. So x i x i prime and then the inverse. So Okay, sorry, the inverse is here, okay? And the inverse. Now, we've also put the similar things. We have the one of n summation and xi, yi. That's the example expression of this one. So if we write it in using the matrix notation, the big X we just introduced, then it's basically x prime x, the big X, right? Inverse x prime y, okay? So that's the familiar linear regression formula where we find out the optimal beta hat uh, using the data we actually observe. All right, now uh, we can also use the formula uh, I just introduced, which is each beta j, okay? Each uh, beta j is the, the beta of each little x. Uh, now each beta j is really the, the uj, okay? Uh, prime y uh, divided by the, uh, the, you know, this varies like uj prime uj. Okay. And this, what this uj is, is running a regression of the, of the jx on all the other x, right? Whatever's left, uj, you can plug into this formula and calculate beta j. Let's see an example, right? Very simple. Uh, I generate some x. x1 is uniform 0, 1. x2 is correlated with x1. So it's 0 0.5 x1 plus 0 0.5, some uniform uh, variable. And then y has this expression. Uh, this, that's the true model, right? So I use uh, some coding to generate that. Now my hope is, of course, running, because the true model is linear, so of course I hope that by fitting a linear model I can get the true parameters, one, uh, minus 2.5, and a five, right? That's what we hope to get. Uh, so that's what we do, right? In R, you simply run a regression of LM, which is the linear regression model of Y on X1 and X2, and you can see we basically get the cur you know, more or less the correct answer, the intercepts is one minus two point five and a five, right? You can also calculate by hand. Okay, uh, so I'm going to we are going to construct the big X. So the big X is a constant plus the x one and x two, right? And then beta is x prime. Beta is this, which is what I'm doing here, right? Just using a slightly cumbersome uh, matrix multiplication notation R, uh, which is essentially what we're doing here. And you can see that it gives us basically the same answer, right? One minus 2.5 and a 5.06. Now, the other way is the way that I introduced just now, which is uh, in order to get beta one, remember here we have beta zero, beta one, beta two, right? We have three different beta. In order to get beta one, what we do is the first step, I run a regression of x1 on x2, okay? x1 on x2. And then I get the residual of their regression. And then I use the covariance divided by variance formula to get the optimal B1, beta one. Similarly for beta two, I run a regression of x2 on x1, right? And then following the same procedure, I give you beta two. And you can see that the result is of course all the same, right? If we plot it, then uh, this is essentially a plot of u1, u1 and the y. And the u1, remember, is the residual of running x1, x2. And this is u2 and the y. And the slope of these lines is beta 1 and beta 2. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about um, what's uh, so special about linear regression. Linear regression uh, can mean different things. In its most broad sense, linear regression is any linear model and for regression purposes. But historically, when we talk about linear regression, we talk about least square linear regression. And the least square linear regression is linear regression by minimizing the L2 error function. Okay, so we have a linear model. The model is H x prime beta 
each hypothesis is a linear. That's a linear model. But even given the linear model, we may not have a, we, we, we do not have to minimize L2, right? We can, for example, minimize y minus x prime beta absolute value. We can do that as well, minimizing the L1, right? But if we minimize the L2, then that's, that's the so-called least square, right? Least square uh, linear regression. Right? Now, if we m minimize the L2, then uh, what, what, what's special about it is that we can immediately solve for beta star and a beta hat, remember? Beta star is the underlying optimal, beta hat is the in-sample expression, uh, which is our best estimator, right? So we can immediately figure out that the formula is x prime x inverse x prime y. However, for many other problems, uh, we, we do not have this kind of solution. This kind of solution is called a analytical solution. Analytical. Meaning that we can mathematically find out a solution, and we can immediately calculate it. For many, for most problems that we're going to encounter after this regression lecture, for most problems we're going to encounter in this course, we do not have analytical solution. We must find out the optimal beta using numerical techniques. Okay. Right. There's no mathematical solution for that. But how do we use a numerical technique to find out the best beta, to mi essentially to minimize this? Well, this course, is not a, uh, this, this course is not a computational course. So we're not going to talk about, well, when I talk about neural network, I, was, I will basically uh, slightly describe some, uh, uh, some numerical algorithms. But uh, for the majority of course, we're not going to discuss numerical algorithms. All right? I'm simply going to intuitively uh, describe what the numerical optimization process look like. Because if you have no solutions, explicit mathematical solution, you have to use computer algorithms to try to find out the best beta. So let's think about how do we find out the, be the beta that minimize this thing? By using, using numerical algorithm, not by solving, not, not by mathematically solving, right? But using numerical algorithm to find out the best beta. How do we do it? Well, the, the simplest or the most stupid way is just to try numerous beta value and see which value give you the smallest uh, error, right? Okay, so imagine you know nothing about numerical, numerical algorithms or you know, just start from scratch, think about the most easiest, easiest way but also perhaps the both the easiest and the hardest way to do it is just to try many, many beta values and then put each beta value in and then calculate this error function and to see which one gives you the smallest value, value of the error function, right? So let's see, okay? So one way to, to visualize this. Now suppose, uh, suppose our model is y equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x. That's our model, right? Then I can, I can write The value, now remember we cannot have our in-sample error, right? In-sample error is the summation of i, y minus uh, beta 0 minus beta 1 x uh, i, right? i is our data, beta 0, beta 1, square, and 1 over n. That's the in-sample error. When I choose, my goal is find beta 0 and the beta 1 that minimize this. Now, I don't have to, I can delete it. Right. It's the same thing, and this is also called RSS, residual sum of squares in statistics. Okay? So minimize the example error, in this case minimizing the RSS, I find out the beta zero and the beta one that do that. Now if we plot this thing, you can think about this RSS as a function of beta zero and beta one. Because y and xi are just data, right? It's a function of beta zero and beta one. And what does this function look like? It looks like something like this, okay? And our goal is to find, and this is beta zero and this is beta one, our goal is to find the optimal beta that minimize this surface, correct? And where is that minimum point? You can see it's the red dot, that's the minimum point. But I don't know where it is. My goal is to using algorithm to find it, right? So let's begin, right? So let me, let me begin with maybe uh, uh, just, a, just a 360 plus zero, right? Let beta zero be 360, let beta two, let beta one be zero. 
So it is a straight, that's a horizontal line, right? It's a zero line. If I use this zero line uh, to fit the, this is my data, you can see it's not a good fit. And on this surface, you can see that the best point is here, but we are here, right? Now, the, the far away of, of the far away from this this optimal point, the higher the value of the R says, right? The, what, 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 uh, or in sample error, we want to minimize. So our goal is to really be here. So we try the first beta value. We are far away, um, or at least we don't know where we are. Let's try another value, right? Now, if we try another value, we're moving from this point to this point. Okay, and uh, let's try it again. In this case, we move from this point all the way to here. So obviously, you can see we're making progress because it seems like we're making smaller error here, right? And finally, if we if we finally you know try this line, we are all the way at the center, which is the minimum point. Okay. Now, how do you know that this is the best? Well, you don't know. So you can try some other values, and you'll see that the error increase afterwards. Okay, and then if you try enough, you see, you find out this is actually the best point. And you have done, right? we're done. We find out the best beta value. So this is, this is the most stupid, but, uh, uh, but you know, the uh, uh, sort of like mechanical way of doing numerical algorithm to finding out the best value of beta. The reason why I, I go through this process uh, is basically try to, my, my point is, for most algorithm that we are going to cover in this course, we're not going to have a mathematical solution for the optimal parameter. So analytical solution doesn't exist. So we almost always, in most cases, we have to rely on numerical algorithm. And how does numerical algorithm work? In its essence, it's trying different parameter value to try to find out which one minimize our E. Okay? That's in its essence. In reality, we would design different algorithms to try to speed this thing up. Okay? Right? Now, for example, how do we, if we start here, right, how do we move toward this point? Now we can try all kinds of values, right? Try numerous values and then finally maybe we're lucky we end up here, we find out the optimal. Now, but we, we can do better than that, right? So different numerical algorithm is essentially different ways of doing that. So for example, if we're here, you can try to calculate, you can move the point a little bit and you can try to calculate its derivative, right? So we can see, okay, the derivative goes this way, then maybe I should go along the derivative and try to reach the point where the minimum point is derivative equal to zero. Okay, so we can use relying information using derivative information to tell us of which direction for us to move. So different numerical algorithm essentially are different ways to try to speed this thing to, things up so that we can better and more quickly find out the minimum point. And for most algorithms we are going to cover in this course, essentially we all rely on numerical algorithm to do that. Uh, in one way, in one sense, you can think about, because in economic, economics and statistics, we talk about estimation a lot, right? Say we estimate model, estimate model, estimate model. I also said that in uh, data science, we use the word learn. We learn a model, learn a model. It's the same thing. But in, a, in, in another important sense, we can say estimation is fundamentally optimization. Okay. Estimation is optimization because what we are doing when we're estimating a model is we're optimizing. We're finding out the minimum of our error function. So anytime we do analysis, we begin by defining what our model is. So model is the first thing you need to define. The second thing you need to define is your, your criteria, which is your error function or your loss function. Right? That's the second thing. So you always begin with a model, and then after the model, you have to define what your loss function, error function is. That's your criteria. And the third step is minimizing right, that criteria, right? Minimizing the error function to find out the best fit. So the third step is basically optimization. So by estimation, we're really doing optimization. Now, uh, in traditional teaching of uh, e economics, uh, in your undergraduate degree, when you're when taught in economics, you're probably, uh, many of you have never taken an optimization course or a numerical methods course. And the part of the reason is that, which, which I think is, is lamentable uh, because uh, optimization is so important anytime you do anything data related. Uh, like, like I said, estimation is optimization to a large degree. Now, the reason why you never learn anything uh, numerical methods is mostly because in economics, in, in typical econometrics, people do linear regression too much, right? There's always linear regression. When you're doing linear regression, very fortunately, we have the analytical solution. We have the mathematical expression. So you never need to, you don't need to do uh, any optimization, right? But that's not the case for the majority of algorithm or the models that we're going to learn in this course.
Okay. All right. Um, and finally, um, not finally, but next uh, I want to talk about is the geographical, sorry, geometric interpretation of linear regression model. Right? So it turns out that uh, we have a nice geometric geometric interpretation. I don't know whether that's familiar to, to you. But uh, let's begin with some simple illustrations. Suppose I have two vectors, A and B. Let's check B and A, okay. two vectors. Now, uh, this theta is the, you know, uh, is the angle between the two vectors. What is the cosine theta? Uh, cosine theta has a nice expression uh, is basically a dot product, right? So it's a dot b, but which is the dot product, you can also write it as just a prime b, right? Same thing, okay? It's so vector multiplication. a dot b divided by the two norm of a and the two norm b. Okay? That's it. That's a cosine theta. So, which means if, um, now if this theta is 90 degree, like this, our b is like this, then what happens is this cosine theta becomes zero, right? Correct? Now, which means in this case, by the way, it's when, they're, when they're perpendicular to each other, we say a and a b as a two vector, they're orthogonal. So we say a orthogonal to b, and when that happens, the dot, the dot product equal to zero, or you know, a prime b equal to zero. Can write that way. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about. Let's start with a vector b. I'm going to project this b onto a. Okay. Let's project this b onto a. So this is my projection. Right. Okay. Then how do I express this projection? Well, it should be very easy. Because we, you know, this projection thing, I'm going to, um, I'm going to call it B star. Yeah, let's call it B star, which is the projection, is basically this B, right? This B cosine theta, correct? Right? Well, not entirely correct, because this B is a vector that points toward uh, this direction. I want to change it to this direction, OK? So I only want the I only want the sort of the uh, you know the, the value the norm of this the size of this but then I want to have the direction of a so I can do this right so this is you know a direction divided by the size which is a unit vector if you don't remember this it's okay perfectly fine let's do you know if you're putting cosine theta into it then you really have a dot b divided by Omega square times it. Okay, so that's a that's a sort of a projection of b onto a. Okay. Now let's think about what we are uh, our OLS our least square beta hat. Okay. So remember, in in our previous beta hat, when we do linear regression, our OLS estimator the beta hat is equal to, okay, this x prime x inverse x prime y, all right? Now, what this really is, is we can think about it as essentially a projection. So this y is really all b here. It's a projection of this, so this beta, let's times this x, okay? Let's times x here. So, so we have this x, right? Okay. Now, what this x beta hat is, by the way, this x beta hat is really our y hat, right? It's a prediction y. So this y hat is actually the projection of y onto x. Just like here, we're doing the projection b onto a. Okay? Now here, look at that. I have the, you can see the similarity here, right? This is like the variance of A, in a sense, which is like the x prime x inverse here, okay? Like this. 
all right? And here is the a dot b and a. So we here we have x dot y, and there's x. So essentially, what we're doing very similarly, we're projecting a y onto x. Now the only difference here is x is now one dimensional. Here we have a one dimensional vector. X is multi dimensional. So if we want to draw it, we can draw suppose this x one, x two. Then this is a surface. Then the linear regression is geometrically speaking, is projecting this y onto the surface, onto this plane defined by x1 and x2. And our y hat is this point, okay? This is our y hat. It's the projection. What is, so in a sense, you can think about y hat as what? As the point that is closest to y, right? But within the surface or within the plane defined by x. Find out the optimal, you can think about the optimal fit as the optimal projection of y in this space. What is this vector, right? What is, from this point to this point, what is that? Do people know? What is this line? Sorry? Residual. Yeah, residual, E, okay? Right, so the, so the model is y given x prime beta plus E, okay? And this thing, our beta hat, x beta hat is equal to y hat is essentially the projection y in this space, and whatever is left is our e. Now remember we said in our earlier uh, slides, I said that you can prove that this e and x are uncorrelated, right? Okay. Once you have optimal x, this e and x are correlated. Once you find out the optimal beta, here what happens to this e and x? This e is perpendicular to the x plane, right? Correct? Right. Once we have the optimal projection, then this E is perpendicular. Okay. So in the, in the same sense that we say they are uncorrelated with X. Okay. So that's a sort of like a geometric interpretation of linear regression as a, as a, as a projection method. Okay. So uh, that's, you know, if I want to stop at uh, talking about finding out the best uh, fit picking the best hypothesis out of uh, the model, linear model, then we are done, right? We already find out the best hypothesis. The best hypothesis is beta hat uh, with this nice mathematical solution, analytical solution, and we are done. Uh, but uh, we are not satisfied with that yet, okay? Because uh, remember, we find out this, X, this beta hat is based on available data, right? It's the example is based on the available data we have, and we only have n data points. But what we care about, again, is of course the underlying population, right? It's not the observed, observed points. So based on this beta hat, what can we say about the underlying population? Specifically, we know that in the underlying population, beta star is the best, right? Remember, I introduced beta star and then beta hat. Beta star is the optimal beta in the underlying population. Beta hat is the in-sample expression, meaning beta hat is what you calculate, use this formula, based on the data you observe. So beta hat is not equal to beta star. Beta star is what, the, what is optimal in the underlying population. Beta hat is what is the best based on the data you observe. They are not equivalent. So we never see beta star. But based on beta hat, what can we say about beta star? Can we say something about that? Right? Now that's essentially, that's a, that's a whole topic of statistical inference. Okay? Um, now we can prove, first of all, we can prove very easily that the expectation of beta hat is equal to beta star. In that case, we say the beta hat is unbiased. Okay, it's not biased because the expectations you guys are equal. Remember the, the definition of bias is the true value, right, minus the expected sort of estimation estimator, right? Now, by expectation, what do we mean by expectation? Here? It means that if I draw many different data sets from the same underlying distribution, right, the same underlying population, if I draw many data sets out, and each data, on each data set. I estimate beta hat. On average, it is this E beta hat, right? So if I draw numerous data sets out from the same underlying population and I calculate the averaged beta hat, it should give me beta star. So that's what unbiased means. But bias is not the only concern. Remember we have the bias variance decomposition? So bias is not the only concern, we also care about variance. Uh, every time we draw a different data set out, we get a different beta hat. How much they vary, that's also Concern to us, right? So, 
Uh, here is the example, just some illustration, that this blue line, uh, there's a typo here, should be red. So red is the true underlying beta star. Uh, but of course, you know, because we only have limited data, so our beta head is going to be different. So every time you have a different data set, it's going to give you a different line, right? And uh, sometimes these lines vary a lot. The variance is really large. If we only have one, two, three, four, five, if we only have five data points, every time we draw five data points out of the underlying population, then it can, you know, the red line, uh, <laughs> sorry, here the, here the blue line is the true line, right? The red line is, uh, is my least square fit. And you can see it changes wildly depending on what five points happen to, you happen to draw. But if I draw many points, okay, so here I draw 50 points, then you can see that the variance become much, much smaller, okay? Right. So mathematically, what we can do is we can use the law of larger numbers, and we can use the central limit theorem to, to prove that, to, to say something about the underlying beta star based on what we see as a beta hat. Right. Now specifically, we can prove this, that the square root of n times beta hat minus the true underlying beta star should approach a normal distribution, right? go to a normal distribution in large sample. And this, this, you know, this arrow d means that as n increase, okay, as our samples have become larger and larger and larger, it will approach okay, in the limit to this normal distribution with zero uh, mean and with this as the variance. Right. This is actually very easy to see, right? I mean, the beta star is Remember, beta, what is beta star? Well, it's basically e x x prime inverse e x uh, y, right? So that's the that's beta star, and uh, beta hat is essentially the the in sample version of that. But the in sample version of this is the mean, right? Is the mean of x i and y i. Now, because it's the mean of x and y, I, then we can, we can apply the central limit theorem, right? Okay, so that's, you can, you can immediately see the correspondence between what, what we have and the central limit theorem expression here. Now, this variance, okay, so this whole thing uh, divided by n essentially is the variance of this beta hat, right? Okay, so it's divided by square root of n here, so the variance of beta hat is essentially this expression where the variance divided by n. So we call this v, and by the way, what is the um, what is the dimension of this this v? The dimension is p plus one times p plus one, okay? because we have you know uh, p plus one variables, right? And so it's a it's a it's a diagonal it's a it's a square matrix p plus one times p plus one, and I call it the asymptotic variance of beta hat. It's not the variance of beta hat; it's the asymptotic variance of beta hat. What does it mean? Well, we do not know the variance of beta hat. We know all this is asymptotic. By asymptotic, we mean when the sample size become large enough. Remember, we deduce, we deduce this formula using based on the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem is when n becomes very large, right? It's a large sample theorem. So when n become large, the distribution of this goes to this normal distribution, but not in small sample not an even medium sample, it has this really, really large sample when it becomes really large, we have this expression. So in other words, this variance is only valid when n is extremely large, okay, according to central limit theorem. That's why we call it the asymptotic variance, meaning, asymptotic meaning when n is really large. Now that's the only thing that, uh, and, and, and what, this, what this variance tell us is how much this beta hat will change every time Every time we put a different, we draw a different data set out of the underlying population. Now, in terms of this variance, we can already calculate this variance because this variance itself is based on expectation, which we do not know, right, in the underlying population. But we can estimate this variance using observed data. So we're going to have this v hat, right? V hat is estimated variance of this beta hat, which we basically replace the, the previous expression with the in sample version, right? So, you know, we, we replace the expectation with the mean, with the average in the data, and then we have this expression, okay? So x prime x inverse x prime 
omega x, x prime x inverse, where this omega is a diagonal matrix with e i square on the diagonal. That's it, okay? So that's the expression. So this v hat we can actually calculate. And based on this v hat, we can do all kinds of, we can do statistical testing, we can do hypothesis testing for different beta, right? So we'll talk about in a, in a, in a minute. But one thing I want to emphasize here is that this v hat again is, a, is, is an estimate of the asymptotic variance. Right? It's not an estimate of the true variance, it's an estimate of the asymptotic variance because everything is based on the central limit theorem. Okay? Now we can simplify this, make this simpler. How to make this simpler? Well, uh, let's, let's, let's make some assumptions about the, this E star. So far we know nothing about this E star, um, but we can make, if we're willing to make uh, some assumptions, so for example, I'm going to assume that the variance of this E star, okay, is a constant. It's a constant. Sigma squared. Okay. Now if I do that, then there is a, there is a, well, conditional x, right? Conditional x star squared, which is equal to the variance. If we assume that is a constant, is a sigma squared, then we call it homoscedasticity. People are familiar with this word, right? Now, assuming this helps, help us minimize, help us simplify things a lot. Why? Well, if we assume that e, e star squared is simply uh, the expectation, the variance is simply sigma squared, uh, then we can replace this with sigma squared e x x prime, right? Which simplifies the formula a lot because that, that the formula just simply be, becomes uh, the normal distribution of zero uh, with this, right? So this is the simplified version because everything else cancel. So this is now our asymptotic variance, and this is how we calculate, it, which is you know the you know the x prime x inverse times the estimate sigma hat. The estimate sigma hat you can simply get from data. Right? You can look at the look at the residual calculate the variance and the sigma hat. Okay. So that makes our variance calculation much easier if we assume homoscedasticity. Now, if we do not assume the homoscedasticity, we call heteroscedasticity, right? Heteroscedasticity, the idea is simply it changes with x. Right? It's not a constant, okay? So, uh, 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 why do we bother with this? Like, why do we need to assume, or why do we ever need homoscedasticity? As you can see, its main function is to simplify the calculation of this variance, estimate variance. But why do we need to simplify variance estimation? Or calculation. Why do we need that? You say, you know, let's look at this formula, right? Is this formula really that hard to do? We can simplify it, yes. Once we simplify it, it looks like this, right? So it's, it, it, it is simple. The calculation is simple. But do we really need it to? Right? For, uh, you know, if we use a modern computer to compute this, that's, you know, basically the same split second as when we calculate this, right? It's not really that much, you know, this, the simplification uh, to a modern computer probably doesn't mean anything at all, right? So, but as you learn in your textbook, uh, you always start with homoscedasticity, and it's, that's one of the assumptions it seems that we always make. And the reason is very simple, because in the old days, when statisticians do this, they don't have computer, right? They don't have computer. So they, people have to calculate by hand, and then when they did that, that's a, that's a pain in the, you know, whatever, right? So it's a huge pain to calculate this more complicated hydroscedastic version of your variance, so people assume homoscedasticity. In reality, is there any reason to ever assume homoscedasticity? Probably not much, okay? There are very few situations where the truly you can assume that the underlying variance is truly constant. Very, very few situations. In most cases, you know, we, we have hydroscedasticity, right? But, the reason why you have homoscedasticity again is because for simplicity. Now there's another reason, which is uh, even if in reality most of the situation we all it's always hydroscedastic, right? Even if that's the case, assuming homoscedasticity wouldn't really will not really change your uh, your uh, your variance estimation that much in most situations, unless your uh, we'll, we'll talk about unless your E star behave is has a very strange distribution. Otherwise, uh, they don't really, it, it doesn't really matter that much. So the answer is, why do we still do homoscedastic today? 
the, the first answer is historical because historically that's what helps people. The second answer is it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, if you assume that, it's not going to really change your variance estimation that much. Okay, change a little bit, but not that much. So we'll see some example on that. Now, once we uh, once we did the variance, once we can estimate the variance, then we can do hypothesis testing, right? So the famous t statistic, uh, which is the beta j hat, right? This is your estimate beta minus the true beta j star divided by your estimate standard standard deviant uh, standard error. The standard error is really the square root of the variance, right? So let's follow the logic here. The logic here is that the beta hat minus beta star, right, divide is, is is approximately a normal distribution. Once we divide by a square root, of it, right? It's approximately a normal distribution. So, imagine let's let's just suppose suppose it is really truly a normal distribution. Then this beta hat minus beta star divided by the square root of variance will just be a normal zero one, correct? Right? Should be very simple. And based on which we can do hypothesis testing. That's the whole idea. Okay? So beta hat minus the true value divided by the square root of the variance should be a normal zero one. Right? Now the should be is a is a strange word because it's not precise. Precisely what we're saying is when we approach a large sample, when our n becomes really large, when the central limit theorem is approximately holds, then this should become a normal zero one distribution. And when it's a normal zero one distribution, we can use it to test our hypothesis. Okay? So what we're saying is there's a normal zero one distribution. Now I'm going to say, I'm going to test uh, these two hypotheses. The, the hypothesis H0, our non hypothesis is beta j is equal to uh, 0. Okay? Let, let's forget about the j, right? Just, just beta, right? Beta star is equal to 0. That's a non hypothesis. And we know that beta hat minus beta star, I oh, forgot about the j, but you get it, right? Square root of variance of beta hat. I know this should be a normal distribution. Now, if my null hypothesis, if my H0 is correct, is true, then this beta star should be 0, right? So I can get rid of this beta star. So under H0, meaning when my H0 is correct, I have this relationship, which is beta hat. I already, I have already calculated this. Divided by square root of variance, which I have also calculated. I, so this item, so this statistic, which is called T statistic, this statistic I already know. I know its value. For example, its value is, um, you know, 1.98, suppose, okay? Suppose the value is 9.8. Now, and also I know that this should be a normal zero one distribution. So let's go to a normal distribution and look at where, where 1.98 is. 1.98 is here. This is 1.98, okay? According if in a normal zero one, and then my question is: Is it is it actually likely to be true? Right? How likely it is? Because if it's truly normal zero one, then this one point nine eight seems to be a pretty extreme value. Okay. Then the question is: Should I accept H zero? Uh, do we accept H zero, or do we do we not accept H zero? Okay, that's the question. If we assume H zero is true, then it should be normal zero one. But if it's normal zero one, then this nine point one point nine eight seems a little bit extreme. So do I accept it or not? If this value is not one point nine eight, if its value is um, zero, okay, to zero. Zero here. Or maybe zero point one, all right, zero point one. Then that that value seems perfectly normal within zero zero one. In that case, I think H zero is probably good, right? I like my H zero. But if it's one point nine eight, or maybe even more extreme, maybe it's two point five, okay? 2.5, then in that case, I think H0 is less likely to be true. So I may reject H0. And in that, in that sense, we say we accept H1. So what is the criteria? The criteria is, well, you all know that, right? The criteria is calculate something called a p-value, but what is p-value is essentially, right, this area, which is how, 
what is the probability that if we assume H0 is correct, what is the probability that we see something that extreme or more extreme on both sides? Okay, add them together, that's your p-value. So if, if, this, if, if the probability of seeing more extreme value is less than 5% or less than 1% or less than 10%, right, you, have, you can have different criteria. So let's say 5%. So if the probability is less than 5%, this error adds together less than 5%, then I say, okay, in that case, I think this value is too large. Which, in which case I think the H0 is not that likely to be true, so I will choose H1, so we basically reject H0, right? So that's the, that's the process of doing hypothesis testing. Okay, right? Everybody, so you know, this is all old stuff to you, but I'm just uh, sort of uh, helping you to uh, uh, at least uh, you know, go through this uh, in, a, uh, in a framework that, uh, that we're discussing, right? Okay, so. Everybody, everybody clear on, on this hypothesis testing uh, idea? It seems to be pretty simple. In fact, it's not that simple, okay? So the p-value has a lot of problems, which I will talk about in my next lecture after regression. Uh, we, have, we have a dedicated lecture talking about the, talk about the problem with the understanding of p-value and, and then, you know, many, many problems of in, in empirical research and applications, many problems with, uh, with the p-value, but right now, Okay, we're not, I'm, I'm going to wait until after this lecture, but right now, let, let me just say it's not that simple. Okay, there's some problem with that, especially in application and in, in understanding of what it truly means. But let me just ask a simple question now. Uh, why, do we, uh, why do we choose uh, this 5%, 10%, 1% is called a threshold, right? So it's the threshold of p-value, right? So, so if p-value drops below this, this threshold we reject, but why do we choose 5%, 1%, 10%? 5%? Well, people, well, why do we choose 5%? Why not choose 50%? Or maybe 95%? Can I choose 95%? In which case, I almost always reject, right? So reject. Can I choose 50%? Why not, why not 50%? Okay, as long as it's, no, it's, it's more extreme, as you know, 50% here, right? These two are added together. As long as it's more extreme than 50%, I'm going to claim that H0 is false and accept H1. Well, in other words, the question is very simple. Why we make the threshold so small? Why? Now, it may not seem obvious to you the connection, but I hope you quickly find the connection with what we have already discovered, uh, sorry, discussed, decision theory, okay? So we already talked about decision theory when in our foundation lecture in the context of how do we make the best prediction. You, the true value is y, the prediction is y hat, right? So remember that in decision theory, our true value is y, and if we assume y has two value, y is minus one plus one, right? Okay, or you can think about it as zero one, zero one, and then our prediction is y hat. So y hat is also zero one. Now, um, if there are, if there are, uh, if, the, if the y hat is exactly equal to y, means your prediction is correct, then my, my loss function, my loss is zero, correct? My loss is zero here, but uh, but if if they're incorrect, if it's zero, but it's one, then we we must put some penalty on, right? The most obvious penalty is the zero one loss function. Okay. Now let's replace this y. So this y is the underlying true y. You don't know this y hat is your prediction, but now let's replace this y with h zero. Beta star equal to zero, okay? In which case, when this equal to one, it means that this is true, okay? This is true, this means it is false. Can I do that? And then what is this y hat? Y hat is your decision. Your decision about your prediction, your prediction about whether this is true or not, okay? So you can think about this y hat as your predicted h, 
H zero, which is you you say okay, you you want to find a decision, you want to form a decision. Your decision is whether this is true or false. Okay, so you can say okay, I think it's false. I think it's true. All right. It's the same. It's the same story, correct? It's basically it's basically the original decision theory where the situation we talk about. I don't know the underlying H zero. I don't know whether it's true or false, but I have to make some prediction whether it's true or false or decision whether it's true or false. And and I have to do something, right? So I have to make. I have to have a criteria. I have to rule. So I I I, I have, um, suppose I have estimated. Okay. Suppose I estimate something like the the value the probability of H zero being true. Suppose I have my estimate. Uh, using this zero zero one loss function, what is my decision rule? How do I how do I decide whether I want to declare H zero false or true? As long as this probability is what? As long as the probability of H zero being true is larger than how much? What is the percentage? According to the zero loss function. 50%, okay? So as long as the probability of H0 being true larger than 50%, I should declare it's true. As long as it's smaller than 50%, I should declare it's false, according to the 0, 1 loss function. Everybody clear on that? Right? Okay? So I hope everybody's clear. If you're confused, you can, right? So maybe uh, we can talk after class, but I, I hope this is clear. According to the 0, 1 loss function, the threshold, the threshold of determining of declaring it's true or false is 50%. It's not 95%, it's not 5%, it's 50%. Okay, so under what circumstance do we increase the threshold? So suppose I say, or decrease, right? Suppose I say, um, or, um, when the probability of each zero is larger than 90%, only, the, only in that case, I would declare it's, I would declare each zero to be true. Otherwise, I, I declare each zero to be false. Only when the estimated probability is larger than 90%, I declare it's true. Otherwise, it's all false. How do I how do I get this? How do I get this rule? I have to change the penalty. What kind of penalty do I increase? What kind of penalty? Which penalty become large? If my decision rule is whenever this is larger than 90%, I declare it to be true. Otherwise, it's false then I'm almost always declaring to be false, right? Which means I'm really afraid of declaring it to be true when in reality it's false, correct? I'm really afraid of that. Which means penalty here, this penalty should be really large. And this penalty is small. When this is the case, I will try to, my criteria will be almost always declared to be false and only under very rigorous, only, only, only under very strict criteria do I declare to be true, okay? In other words, I, I try to avoid, what type, of, what type of error is this? <laughs> do people know? So here's a, here's a graph to help you guys. H0, right? So when the underlying, when the underlying is true, but so here's when the underlying is false, I'm sorry, when the underlying is false, but I declare to be true, it's type. So this is type two that we are really worried about. If we worry about type two, we put a with a large penalty on it, and then our and the, the result is our decision rule will be a very large ninety percent, right? In what case I do a very small threshold. My threshold is only five percent. So as long as it's larger than 5%, I declare to be true. In that case, I'm really worried about type one error. So I really don't want it. I really don't want to be the case in which it is true, but I declare to be false. Okay? So that's really the, right? That's, that's, the, that's the, you know, the, the, the sort of a, the underlying decision theory scenario right, we're talking about. So how do we connect this with the p-value? or with hypothesis testing. It's the same story, correct? It's exactly the same story. In hypothesis testing, we're also doing decision rule, the, the decision theory. In, in the, the reason why we choose 5% or 1% or 10%, we choose a small threshold, is because in this case, we are really worried about what type of error. What type of error do we, are we 
are we really worried about? We're really worried about the underlying H being true, but we reject, but we, we, we wrongly uh, accept the alternative, or we're worried about the underlying uh, the H is false, but we wrongly accept it. Which one are we worried about? It's not that hard. In this case, it's the type one error. We're really worried about. We're worried about the H zero, right? Is is actually is true, but we wrongly reject it. Okay, we wrongly declare H one is true. In this case, we want to what? We want to accept H zero most of the time. Only under extreme situations do we reject it. So that's why we set our threshold really low. Okay. So we can link it out. So this is actually, I, th I believe you have all learned this before. I'm just linking this to decision theory. What I'm saying is, I guess what I'm saying here is that you should view this threshold thing, this p-value threshold thing, as, as a decision rule. And the reason why we, we have decision rule in which it's 1%, it's, 2%, it's or 5%, it's a very small number, is because we care about here the type one error a lot. That's why you can think about we put a lot of penalty on this that's why we end up with a very small threshold for p-value. Okay, that's the underlying connection. Now it's not quite one-to-one -one connection, uh, as we as we talk as we discuss after this lecture, because the p-value is not the probability of h zero. So here, when we talk about decision theory, we're, so we're saying we want to accept or we want to accept or reject. You know, choose one of them based on our estimation of the probability of h zero. But p-value is not the probability of h0, okay? It's the probability of, of observing a statistic conditional on h0 being true. And that key difference uh, can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. So, uh, also mispractice. So that's something I will talk about after this lecture, all right? Now, um, I think we are running out of time. Let me just quickly wrap it up. R squared, uh, you all know what R squared is, so let me, okay, so that's it, okay, we're done. Um, well, actually, no, uh, I, I remember what I want to talk about. Um, so R squared is explanation of how much variance uh, in Y is explained by your model, right? So, uh, you know, the, uh, so this is the formula you understand, but one thing that you all know is that R squared can never go down, right? So, oh, I'm sorry, when you add more variables, R squared can never go down. And I have already explained the connection between this and the approximation generalization trade-off we discussed in foundation, right? So the more x variable you add to your model, the more complex your model become. So as your model become more complex, your e in will never increase, right? Typically decrease. And what is the e in? The e in, when e in decreases, the same thing as the r squared increase. So as you add more variables, you make your model more complicated, of course r squared will never go down, it typically increase. Just like our e-in will always decrease. Not, not always, but never increase, right? Typically decrease. It's the same story. Now, just as, just as we, what you're learning in statistics, that it's not the true, it's not true that the more x variables, the happier, the merrier, but it's not true that the higher the R-square, the better. Because adding, I actually don't know how traditional statistics explain that, right? How do we explain the fact that it's not always the better to add more variables? But after our foundation lecture, you should all be clear about that. Because as you add more variables, Yes, your e will go down, but hey, your generalization become worse, right? So your, ultimately your e r may go up. So that's a trade-off um, that you should all be very familiar now. And then finally, let me just show you uh, one simulation. So I did a little simulation here. X is a uniform var variable between zero and 100. Y is five X plus e, but e here is a little bit strange, right? E here is a, uh, a normal distribution, but extremely heteroscedastic. Right, so it's exponential vax. So the variance increase uh, exponentially with the x, uh, with the value of x. So that's a very heteroscedastic error. Um, so let's do it, right? Yeah, simulate some values. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a regression in R. And what we can see is uh, this is intercept this x. And according to the estimate of standard error, which is the estimate of you know, uh, the standard error for the beta, it is significant, okay? The x value is significant according to the p-value. 
So uh, the, the problem with this approach is that whenever you run the plain vanilla regression in R, and in most statistical package, the standard error calculation is based on the assumption of homoscedasticity. Okay? But in, in our case, the error is obviously very heteroscedastic. So this is no longer true. Okay, the standard error calculation <coughs> is probably way off. So in order to do the heteroscedastic version, we need to use a, uh, a package. Uh, the, uh, well, actually, all we need to do is we specify v -cof is equal to uh, the H B of HC, which is the way to specify that you want to estimate a robust heteroscedastic uh, standard error in R. And then once you do that, then you have got the heteroscedastic estimate standard error, and you can see that X is no longer significant, uh, you know, based on our data points above, right? So, so this is an example of heteroscedastic error being very different from homoscedastic error, and this one should be the one that we use. In most applications, where the, uh, in most applications where the E is not that extreme, okay? The heteroscedasticity is not that extreme. In most situations, these two will be very close to each other. So whatever is significant at the 5% value will be significant at the 5% value if you, if you change switch from homo to heteroscedastic. So in most applications, it probably doesn't matter. That's why the default is still homoscedasticity, right? But in, in these extreme cases, you can clearly see the difference between the two. Uh, and then, like I said, homoscedasticity is a convenient assumption that almost never holds in reality, but it's good enough in most cases. Okay, uh, so that's where we want to finish today, uh, and uh, let's continue on Thursday. Okay.